Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. Hey, if you just press play, you're missing out on 23 minutes of us talking about different ways of watching movies. So, and, and kind of the benefits or, or lack of benefits, I guess, of movie theaters, uh, watching on your phone, stuff like that, because we wanted to talk about memorable or interesting movie theater experience, whether good or bad, and kind of what that was like. And um, yeah, I, I always think this is interesting because everyone always has like either that really fascinating movie theater experience that's like everything, yeah. not just the movie, but the the group of people is exciting. I, I think the most recent would probably be like if you saw No Way, Spider-Man No Way Home on opening weekend, it was mm-hmm. nuts. Um, that was like crazy um but then there's also the nightmare experiences that we've all had i know yeah if you're a long time listener daniel has shared many several <laughs> nightmare experiences oh, that no. continue to happen so <laughs> um yeah if you support on patreon for three dollars a month that's the minimum tier uh you get access to all these sorts of benefits it's pretty cool and um there's the other stuff that you'll hear about as you're listening to the podcast uh, and, and on other episodes too, you also get a lot of additional content, some of which can be upwards of an hour. I think one of the things we just did for anime was like an hour of content that wasn't like available for free. So yeah, $3 a month. That's nothing. Um, we are way cheaper than other streaming services. We don't put out as much content, but <laughs> it goes to people like us, which is exciting. So, yeah. um, yeah, if you do that, that'd be cool. And you'll be my best friend. Um, but you press play. <laughs> to hear us do a party pleaser episode on hunger games 2 catching fire hunger games catching fire and um Mm -hmm. party pleaser episodes what we do is we are going to describe the movie from beginning to end we'll cut in and out with commentary um and then we will decide if this one's a party pleaser or a party pooper uh or Mm, I, I soft recommended doing a party of one <laughs> in the last <laughs> one because I wasn't sure. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if I want to lock in definitively. You got to decide, right? A party mm. or a party pooper, which I always think is interesting. Or add that as a leeway. We will see after a couple more party pleasers. You must but, decide. Yeah. So I no I like middle that, ground. Right? I love that. That middle, <laughs> like not having middle ground, is so much more exciting. You can I like. But anyways, you must choose if you are a Hunger Games fan. We actually did do the first Hunger Games a couple weeks ago, maybe two months ago at this point. And so you could go back and listen to that if you haven't. If you haven't seen the Hunger Games, but you just want to hear us talk about it again, there's the other one. And then you'll have this one, too. And we have intentions to do the rest, whether or not they'll be party pleasers or movie discussions. I guess it'll depend on how the movies go, because this one, I finished it and thought, this could have been a movie discussion, but but mm, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, interesting. So yeah, uh, let's let's get into it. I know Melanie, you took the notes this time around. So uh, anything yes, you want to say beforehand? Because I know you're the the hunger head, as they call it. Uh, <laughs> they do out of the two of, <laughs> two of us. I didn't even yeah. know. No, the nobody calls it that. I, made that up. <laughs> I was like, is that real? That sounds so weird. <laughs> uh, anyway, um. No, I mean, I think it's this is just a continuation of, a, of the last of the last film. They they pick up almost right where it 
left off. And I do mm-hmm. just want to say that I think overall this film was done a lot better than the first one. So it'll be really interesting to to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so um, in the beginning of um, Hunger Games Catching Fire, we have uh, Katniss who is trying to go back to a normal life before she then has to be a mentor with PETA and go on tour to promote the upcoming, the 75th Hunger Games. So anyone who is a victor usually then mentors the next group of candidates. So she's just, however, she's finding that doing normal things um, in life has just become very difficult because of the trauma that she has experienced, which I think is just a huge theme. A huge theme throughout the entire film is just how people experience trauma, how they process it. Um, and even just how there is this, um, almost there can be a, a bit of tension between those who have experienced this traumatic experience versus those, those who, have who, yeah. who have not. And I was actually just, you know, you see that a little bit between her and, and Gail, um, not Dale, Melvin. Yeah, I remember it. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's not, it's not Dale. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and and I found that I didn't know what you thought of like how they depicted that, but I just thought that, that was really fascinating. Just seeing kind of how their relationship has changed. I I didn't mind that. I I thought that that kind of like what can be difficult with the sequel is kind of setting the groundwork of where we are now. And you were mm-hmm. right. Like the thankfully this one just starts almost immediately after. Um, like yeah, it's probably been like a year since the last Hunger Games, but. Uh, not a lot happens in a year, especially it seems yeah. like in the districts, district 12 in particular. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was, I just in terms of like, I know you're still setting the groundwork, but like the beginning of this movie does set up at least where the characters are, which largely haven't changed that much. And we'll get into that more as we keep going. But, um, yeah, characters are, we're, we're seeing where everyone's at right now. Yeah. So we kind of see how, um, Gail expresses his love for Katniss um, and just how he felt betrayed by just how she was acting and so in love with PETA, but she is adamant that it was just an act. But we also have PETA kind of giving Mm -hmm. this very like polite, you know, manner, but is also very distant. And that becomes more evident when they have to perform in front of the camera. So there's just like a lot of mixed emotions and feelings and, you know, they they're they're trying to, like, just find a way to move forward. So that was the thing I liked the most about the last one um, was that, like, by the end of the movie, all of the characters are lying <laughs> and just. Being yeah. like And I, I was like, oh, this is like a like it's a victorious end, but it's also a little scummy. I like this, like mm. in, a, in a in a fictional dramatic way. Like, I like that, like. Yeah, they're being interviewed by Stanley Chuchi at the end. And yeah. it's just like we're so happy with each other. It's like y'all right. lying. <laughs> y'all right. Lying. No, they're just they're just trying to they're lying to survive. Yeah. And to just be able yeah, yeah, yeah. to move on with their lives, like count their blessings. They both didn't yeah, have to die. Home. And just want they want to get home, they want to get back to their loved ones. And so while they're in District 12, President Snow pays her a visit. Mm-hmm. And it's there that he threatens her. He's like, you need to keep up with your love story with PETA, no more statements or acts of rebellion. And if you do do any of those things, like if you threaten our stability in any way, I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going to destroy all of district 12. And then he references just like I did with district 13. And we don't really know a ton about that. I think at this time, but later on it's explained that. Yeah, that was good. I like that just narratively like dropping that in like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, this what's before. that? <laughs> yeah. So he is not playing any games. And I also like the fact that he's honest. Like he doesn't try to lie he's a good villain. or deceive I like or pretend he's like, I am what I am and this is how it's going to be. So she's of course terrified and she, um, she, I think just, she has said in her mind that she's going to do just that. So PETA and Katniss then have their first on-screen interview, which is kind of the beginning of this tour that they have. And it's a bit awkward them trying to pretend to be in love again after mm. they've spent so much time apart, but they make it work. Uh, Peter is usually very, you know, eloquent. So he kind of saves the day when it comes to Katniss's awkwardness. Yeah, yeah. And afterward, they just set off right into touring. And the tour is basically them going from district to district and um, 
promoting the next Hunger Games, talking about their love story, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the, the promo tour. So, but what I actually really, one of my favorite scenes is when they're making their way to their first stop and PETA just has this heartfelt conversation with Katniss, just basically explaining, I'm not angry with you. I know what you did was to save our lives and you did save us. And if you can, you know, not look at me like I'm a wounded, you know, dog, then yeah. maybe I can move on. And what I really loved about that was I felt like he was respecting her. Cause I think, you know, sometimes not just, not, not just men, but women, like when we feel burned or someone doesn't reciprocate our feelings, I think it's very easy to become very bitter. And I think that he's kind of looking at things big picture and he respects Katniss enough to not try to convince her of anything, but just be like, I understand this isn't how you feel. Let's just be friends. And I feel like he treats her that way pretty consistently yeah he doesn't fall into the trap of the friend zone or believing the friend zone exists like he mm. doesn't get deluded into that where it's like he is getting this tension this false tension about wanting to be with someone romantically and them not being interested yeah. um and I, I like that because it's in conjunction to the fact that they're performing as though they're interested in each other. So yeah. I'm sure that would be very confusing. Um, yes. But he he takes it in strides uh, in theory, because uh, as we yes. learn like later on and maybe in the sequels, there's more of it. But uh, later on in this movie, we kind of learn a little more of his internal uh, thoughts uh, as as he talks. But I digress. Yeah, I am. I, um, I wish there was more scenes like this scene. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, f what I was enjoying was some more character stuff uh, of characters talking um, and not just talking, but like learning about them while they talk. Cause there isn't mm -hmm. actually a lot. Um, yeah. The the movie's so in, it, it enjoys a lot of its extravagance and mm -hmm. we'll kind of get into that as we keep going. Hey, don't forget. There's a lot of fun content missing from this episode because you're not listening on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support for $3 a month to gain access to uncut episodes with upwards of 40 minutes of bonus content each. You'll thank me later. After they, they get to their first stop, District 11, so it's kind of like they're working their way backwards just until they get all the way to the Capitol. And that's where Thresh and Rue came from. Mm. And so they you know, they ditch the cards and just feel so moved. They give these like really heartfelt speeches to honor those tributes. Uh, but when they're done, there's a person in the crowd who holds up the three finger salute, um, which comes from district 12. So I guess like in a way to like honor them and say that I'm with you, mm -hmm. but that is now seen as an act of rebellion. So the guards from the Capitol grab him and kill him in front of the whole crowd. And it's terrible and it's brutal. like, it's so brutal, but it's <laughs> after this moment that Katniss and Peta and them realize that as mentors, their lives will never be back to normal. They can yeah. never really be their true, their true selves on screen. They're just going to be playing this game for as forever. long as, as forever, for as long as they live, as long as they are mentors. And so as they travel to the other districts, they decide to do exactly what Snow wants them to do. They follow the script. They don't cause any problems. And while the richer districts, so like districts one and two are in support of the Capitol and will like applaud their fake speeches, mm -hmm. um, the poorer, more oppressed districts hate them. And they want them to stop pretending and just tell the truth because um, stirrings and rebellion, acts of rebellion have already begun to, to take place. Yeah, there's like when they're on the train, there's iconography of like mm -hmm. rebellious things that are being graffitied and stuff. It's, yeah, um, yeah. the The world, the first film is very insulated, uh, and that's definitely budget. Uh, that's really insulating a lot of the atmosphere because there's a lot of. I, I criticize the first one for cinematography and editing, uh, which I do not have for this one. Uh, this one, both of those are improved, and mm -hmm. um, the first one though, one way to get away with making your budget look bigger 
well, not bigger, just not making it look so small, is have a lot of close-up shots of characters because then yeah. any extras in the background can be almost in like a cone shape where there's mm-hmm. not actually that many. It's just they're in the frame. And then and, – and the the opening of the first movie is super congested. Um, and then even when things open up, it's mostly just uh, – th- there's a common criticism of sort of like DIY movies from like the 80s and 90s, very cheap. 70s 80s 90s movies that like oh it's just going to be like the the back of the cover of the 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 vhs will say like there's a monster and this person gets transformed and he's going to go killing people and this and that and then the movie's just a bunch of people walking around in the woods (laughs) because Mm -hmm. like it's free and no one's going to stop you (laughs) and um hunger games one turns into that in in a good okay way like that's the stuff i liked more in the first one um but most of the stuff in the capital most of the stuff anywhere else is inside and then in this movie not just what they shoot but like there's just more narrative things asserting that life is things are taking place outside of our main characters and i i liked that opening of the scope uh yeah it it feels like a sequel is what I'll say. Mm-hmm. Like sequels need to open up more. Yeah. And this one does it in ways that this this stuff really works for me. I like it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that there's a lot more commentary on things like propaganda or reality TV or yeah. just how audiences receive information, regardless of whether it's true or not. I just feel like, again, throughout the film, you see this commentary on all of that just very, very clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so when they finally reach the Capitol after doing this tour, uh, President Snow is hosting a party, and it's there that Katniss meets Plutarch Heavensby, and he's Gosh, th- these this names. year's game maker. <laughs> I know I had to like write them because even I was like sometimes I'll be like, who was that again? Oh yeah. So, um, but I love the fact that the author like steps out of the box and creates these like different names but anyway i wish we could compile a list of all of the teens that read these books and how they pronounced these names like was it Platurch? Uh... did somebody read it as Platurch heavens <laughs> he- i guess heavens be is pretty easy but i will i Platurch will confess be bad. <laughs> i will confess i when i was reading the books twilight um because i read them first before i saw the films too late um uh, <laughs> there is the character carlisle and I had heard the name before, Kaliz, but I'd never seen it spelled out before. Car-Lizley, so I called him Carlissel. Carlissel. Car-Lizley. Car-Lizley. <laughs> That's great. It was so. <laughs> and then a, I said it out loud to a friend and she's like, um, you mean Carlisle? Carlisle. And I had never yeah. laughed so hard. I was so embarrassed, but I thought it was so funny. It's like, I can't even feel bad. <laughs> just well, you had laugh. your, you had your pita bread <laughs> moment with uh, I did. Hunger Games. So it's fair. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, what was the one I did it with? I read the Charlie yeah. Bone books growing up and one of the characters name is Mr. Ominous, I think, but I mm-hmm. didn't know the words. So I said Aminius in my head, <laughs> nice. so, but that's about as embarrassing as it gets for me. <laughs> Aww, well, that's good. Yeah. No, I, and at least I only said it in front of one person and Car- like a whole Car- crowd of people. Yeah. It was so bad. That's but like a anyway. rapper name, but like for a white rapper, <laughs> like a bad Midwest <laughs> Carlizzle. <laughs> puts out an album called the shizzle or something it's like oh real gosh. bad it's like oh man that's like dollar I'm bin so at the glad. walmart <laughs> like, <laughs> i'm so glad the like chisel mon you know for rizzle whatever that was i'm just it's glad gone. that that was very short-lived and it's gone but lil saying lil's still in though it's still here it yeah. is still here but anyway so <laughs> So I just she... envision this this fake rapper I made up is just Tobin Bell from the Saw movies. Whenever they do a flashback to show like he's around, he's he's an old actor, like he's an old looking guy. But to make it a flashback, they just give him a like a ball cap and make it go backwards and give him a hoodie. And it's supposed to be like you 30 years before. You created this whole You're character like, oh in like a minute. <laughs> I would listen to that album. <laughs> Beats by Billy. That's what the oh puppet's gosh. name is, by the way. <laughs> anyway i laugh at my own joke someone has to <laughs> i'm laughing i'm with you thank you nice <laughs> um so plutarch heavensby is this year's game maker so he's the one that like designs the games and runs the show 
next to the president. And so he shares a very cryptic message with her while they're dancing, um, stating how she inspired him to come back and to lead the games this year. And he says a quote to make it, the games mean something, which Katniss really doesn't understand, but doesn't pay too much attention to. And so um, when she does see the president, it's very clear that he's not impressed with their tour and with how they acted in the other districts. And this starts to make Katniss very, very nervous. Mm -hmm. And what I love about what I just said is that there was no dialogue to suggest anything yeah. that I said. It was literally just a look from across the room. President Snow shakes his head and she just like the concern on her face is so evident. So like kudos to all the actors. I feel like they all did an amazing job. Yeah. There's a lot um, of knowingness going on. Yes. And I, and I, and I love that. And so um, when Katniss and Peter return home, uh, they're soon followed by these new peacekeepers that come to the district. They come there to enforce more strict laws to sow fear, not only to keep that district in line, but to keep all of Pan Am in line, kind of using them as an example and to stop the districts from rebelling in any way. And it's even during one of the raids that Gail um, intervenes between a peacekeeper and a person, someone being hurt. Mm -hmm. He's then whipped at the whipping post. And this is really important to the story because Katniss intervenes. She gets in the way, which is exactly what President Snow said, stop interfering. But of course she does because that's, her best friend. And um, even Hamish and Peta also intervene to protect Katniss. And this causes, after this whole incident is like settled and done, this causes President Snow to see not just her, but all of the victors of the games as a threat. Because now they feel untouchable. And he's like, we yeah. can't have this. We can't have any kind of um, people thinking that they can get away with whatever they want. So to eradicate this threat, Heavensby and President Snow decide to change the rules of this year's games. So for the 75th Hunger Games, all the names of the contestants will be chosen from the surviving victors of each district. So this means that Katniss and all the others who have survived the games have to go back and play them again, which of course is incredibly devastating for everyone. Yeah, and I see you have a note for this, but it immediately asserts that, like, uh, since they're going to be picking a male and female as they do, she's the only living female victor from District exactly. Twelve. Exactly, so guarantees that Katniss will be in the games again. So it's just immediately like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, kudos to Jennifer Lawrence. She does such an amazing job at just expressing this devastation and fear and again just this trauma response to like all these horrible things that she had to witness and do and um yeah it's just it was it's a really hard scene to watch because you're mm. just like oh my god especially if you haven't read the books when you when you hear that you're like what like i can't yeah, believe yeah, yeah. that they have to go back it's not fair You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Yeah, so there's even a scene where Katniss kind of comes to and she's like, oh, oh, snap, it's not just me. It's going to be Hamish yeah. and Peeta as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she goes to Hamish and says, listen you need to protect PETA. He's like the best of us. He has to survive, not me. And she makes Hamish promise and promise and, and Hamish agrees. He's like, I'll, I'll do what I can. So whether he takes his place in the games or just protects him while he's in the games, Hamish promises Katniss that he's going to do what she wants. And so when the reaping happens, Katniss of course is chosen. Yes. They do, they do this whole ceremony, but for what there's like one name in the bowl. And mm -hmm. um, Hamish's name is chosen, but Peta, of course, volunteers in his place. And immediately after, they are rushed into the capital, unable to say goodbye to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. As Katniss and Peter prepare for their first event, the tribute parade, Katniss meets one of the, the victors. His name is Finnick O'Dare. And he's like this pretty boy, exuding confidence and arrogance, all of which seemed to annoy Katniss, which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, he's and, a real hot, hot tater tot. Yeah. Uh, you can 
you can imagine like there's so many tumblers that were built around the sky people no, doing gif that... collections of him yes. drinking water like there's so much from this movie that's about that the sky. actor is is very very <laughs> handsome but what i think is interesting is if you look at some of you his call other roles Todd, it's okay i did <laughs> Fine. I've never heard that <laughs> phrase used, but I love hearing you say it because oh I think gosh. it's really funny. <laughs> I love that I have a host that has like lived under an internet rock. <laughs> like yes. I've gone, I've gone from Daniel, who is like exposed, <laughs> like I have been, to so much. I mean, this is like after the internet horror episode, where like me and yeah. him are like, remember this thing about this and that, and then you're just sitting there wide eyed like, like a child, like crickets. whoa, <laughs> like or this is what? amazing. <laughs> oh man, man, you stare yeah. at the void, it stares back at you, but mm. that's why I know about the hot hot tater tot so hot hot tater tot that's yeah. so funny but i think what's interesting about that actor too is that he's gone on to do other things and i feel like he's kind of stepping away from like the pretty boy stuff and maybe trying to do things that are a little bit more a little bit slightly different i still feel like he's kind of pigeonholed a little bit unfortunately but so after their brief conversation katniss and Peta, along with the others do the parade on the chariots and then of course in cinna design their costumes, their clothing creates this fiery illusion, which seems to impress everyone, but is also just another act of defiance, which, I mean, at this point, it's like, you're throwing us into the games. Why pretend? I'm just going to feel how I feel and say what I'm going to um, and defy you in any way that I can, which is how I would feel. I I was getting a little tired of how samey the movie was feeling by this point because at this point uh, i think this is about an hour into the movie an hour and 10 mm -hmm. minutes in the movie this movie's long two hours and 20 minutes i watched yes. this over the course of like four days um i kind of just had i just <laughs> i cannot tell you how busy i've been lately so it's just mm -hmm. been like oh i'm on break let me let me watch a little bit oh okay cool and so uh I was getting a little frustrated that the movie was feeling so samey. Like I liked some of the newer stuff in the beginning of the movie, I right? Guess, so yeah, I, I feel like you. the concept of doing the tour. So you have to, now you've won the games, you have to advertise for it. And so, yeah, it's like, you're still playing. You have to keep performing and Katniss in particular, who disrupted the status quo mm -hmm. really has to keep playing. Like yeah. you don't get to go to a normal life and nobody probably ever did. But uh, I think Hamish made that clear. But like, mm -hmm. um, but there was at least probably something more normal before Katniss showed up. And so uh, I, I was enjoying some of those newer things. But then, yeah, they end up going back into the games. And there's some hope that there will be different new things, which we'll talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. Because like they show the other players and it's like they're all victors. One of them is basically uh, what's the guy uh, Jaws from from a uh, oh uh, and, uh, and a and a baria, from I like think. James Bond yeah basically She's like Jaws like filed yeah. her like teeth to teeth. be like fangs um and so like like they talk <laughs> about how like there's that. like people yeah that, I'm like whoa this is cool um and then there's like yeah there's the techies who can like build anything mm -hmm. and then there's like people who are sneaky so I was like oh okay so we're gonna do like the classic arena style thing of like you have these weirdos go to fight each other, but because they have weird Naruto like powers, like it's super <laughs> cool. Um, and I think yeah. I talked about that in the first one that I was like, I was kind of hoping like there would be some weirdo powers, but I also know part of the appeal is they're yeah. just a bunch of kids, but now they're a bunch of victors. So I was looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, by this point we're an hour and 10 minutes and there's, like even the dress was just the same, but with better special effects because the special yeah. effects look really good in this movie. At least I think so. Uh, yeah. Especially nowadays with the congestion of bad CG. Right. People are being rushed and poorly treated. But uh, all that to say is I, I was, this was about an hour and 10 and an hour and 15 in and I was like, okay, like do, so, do something a little new. And not yeah. to get ahead of myself, but they then do the dress twirl thing again. And I was like, come on. <laughs> like, yeah, well, well, they're gonna, <laughs> right. Well, they're going to do it because Ugh. it's it's a big part of the book. And I think that's I, I, yeah. I don't think they wanted so to I'm deviate too book, far but, from that. But yeah, and which is, again, totally fine. But a lot of the sameness kind of just keeps happening. Yeah. Um, so she 
So they do the parade. Um, Hamish is trying to get them to make allies or else they'll be easy yes. targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they go to their practical training and preparation, Katniss avoids, the, they're known as the careers because mm-hmm. they're the people in District 1 and District 2 who are the only districts where people actually volunteer because we talked about this. It's like a rite of passage. It's for them, it's like honor, honorable to do the games. And so she avoids them and chooses to make allies with people she thinks she can trust. So like Beatty and Wireless, who you already explained, were like the techie intellectuals. Yeah. And then, of course, Mags, who's just elderly and cute and sweet, even though she doesn't talk. I wish I wish she talked. I was like, I was so disappointed when she narratively did not like she seems mute or something. I was so desperate for like. It would yeah. have been so interesting to have like an adult who's like very mm-hmm. old to then she share seems very wise things. Also. Yeah, yeah, like that would have been. I was so excited for that, and then she yeah. doesn't say anything. And I'm then, like, oh, no, no, come on. It's, it's a missed opportunity. But again, <sighs> it's a, it's not the director; it's the book. Yes, yeah, it's the original story. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. So during the training, Katniss demonstrates her skill with a bow. She impresses people. Hamish is like, a bunch of people want to ally with you. Who do you want? Mm -hmm. And Katniss is very adamant on working with the people that I just named because she feels like those are people she can trust. Or she's like a nobody. and Which I totally woman. understand because I even like she's playing the game, but she there's just certain things she doesn't want to like lean into. She's like, if it's yes. up to my survival, I am not going to pick people that are I know for a fact are going to stab me in the back. Mm-hmm. So um, after some time has passed, the contestants demonstrate their skills in front of a panel to get their rankings. And while the rankings usually help them get sponsors, PETA and Katniss decide to not participate at all they're just like i'm just we're gonna make a rebellious statement mm. so Peta does this beautiful painting on the floor of rue's burial oh, where that... she's surrounded by wildflowers i'll um, finish describing the scene and then i'll then i'll talk sorry go ahead uh, no it's fine and then katniss she seems inspired by what he did because he went first so she takes one of these like dummies like the fighting dummies that they'll use to like aim things at and she paints Seneca Crane's face on it. And then she hangs the the dummy with by the neck with a rope. And then she kind of does like her little bow, like, you're mm-hmm. welcome. Or mm-hmm. ta-da. M- you know, Melanie's and, doing the bow. Yes, I'm <laughs> she, doing she the bow. I'm like making the gestures like you can see me. But <laughs> anyway, I always forget about that, that you can't see my face. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so she she's kind of like an actor. So was Seneca Crane the previous game? guy yes so seneca okay. crane was the first was the 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 74th game maker before and, before philip seymour hoffman showed up yes and he was killed that's right um yeah because i think he yeah. killed himself because he ate like the berries but ju- judicially he was ostracized right. like by yeah. life ostracized from life uh because yeah. of uh of failing to failed. Yeah, run the games properly. I so right. I had suspected I didn't know that maybe the book says this overtly that PETA had painted the painting of Rue. Yes. My suspicion initially was because I was confused and I was like, is this um, a, oh, is someone playing a mind game? Like a mm-hmm. really dirty trick. Cause they had everyone has seen the games. Uh, so I was like, did someone waste their, t- like not waste their time because the people watching as potential sponsors would get it. They'd go, Oh, this person is gunning for Katniss. And yeah. so I thought it was setting up that like somebody really had beef with Katniss mm-hmm. and decided I'm going to play a total mind game and draw this beautiful thing of room knowing when Katniss steps out here, she's going to choke. Because she's going to be totally traumatized. Because the movie set yeah. up the dramatization theme, yes. and so definitely. Uh, but I guess that also makes sense that Peta might do that. I I like my idea a little more. I, <laughs> I want more nastiness. That's what I want. And this movie does have a lot of nastiness. There's yeah, some good it's, nastiness. it comes later. But um, yeah, yeah, no, that was that was definitely uh, Peta. It's like five minutes before the game start is when the nastiness begins, and it's like, Whoa, yes. that's so mean. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's we'll get there. Really, really terrible. <laughs> So, but yes, we'll get there. 
Um, so the final event of the promo takes place where they, the contestants do like their televised interviews, but there's also a live audience, but each contestant in their own subtle way seems to be trying to stop the games from happening by Mm -hmm. gaining sympathy from the people. So the careers are like crying and talking about you're our family and we'll miss you. Um, Katniss's dress, of course, as you said, she does the little twirly twirl Mm -hmm. and becomes this mocking Jay outfit. And she, you know, thanks to Cinna who designed the, the, the dress to turn into the Mockingjay outfit. And, you know, she, again, another symbol of rebellion and active defiance, not just for Katniss, but for Cinna as well. Yeah. Cause um, we heard that Snow wanted her to wear it in particular. She wanted him to her to wear that wedding dress. Yeah, and then, but then Cinna had designed it so that if you do this twirl, something will happen and you're like, oh, it's something rebellious. And, and it is. Yeah. Yes. And then Peta which I thought was genius, like told everyone that Katniss is pregnant. I audibly reacted to that. I was like, oh, good. Like that was yeah, so smart. Yeah, that, like, so that was so smart. smart. And because yeah. it's like, oh, well, she's, you know, she's pregnant. You know, we, you know, stop the games. You know, people were upset. But unfortunately, despite their attempts, nothing works and everyone still has to compete mm-hmm. in the games. So, yeah, as Katniss and Peter are saying their goodbyes to Effie and Hamish, Effie gives Hamish and Peter this like, golden token as like something to unite the team so effie's like i have my gold hair katniss has her gold mockingjay pin you guys should have something so she gives haymitch a golden bangle like a Mm -hmm. a bracelet Mm -hmm. and she gets um a gold medallion for Peta. Mm -hmm. and right before they leave katniss reminds haymitch of his promise to save Peta if necessary to save Mm -hmm. him instead of her and meanwhile president snow and um plutarch heavensby They have their own plan to not just kill Katniss. They want to destroy her image. And they've been trying to do that since the beginning. But specifically in the games, they want her to they want to see her kill other people or to kill one of her allies to kind of show that she isn't a symbol of hope, but she's just like everybody else. She's trying to survive. And so that's their plan. I was really I'm really enjoying I like a a villain who has already won and then is now having to preserve their victory. So Snow, Uh right? He's already in power. He's president. And now he has to preserve it. And there's sort of this like knowing, like, I don't know how I'm trying to find the particular words, but it's sort of the unique experience of like comfortable instability where like he Uh is very comfortable in every situation, but in reality, he's very fragile because something could totally disrupt it and because he has so much to lose. And so I like him being this villain that's like recognizing that he's also dependent on others. So I like the Uh addition on the addition of Plutarch Evansby because I like, I also just liked that character. I like that he's sort of like this weird, clever, smart and almost sinister guy that I I was really, really enjoying as a villain um, for the movie. Yeah. Yeah. This is some good stuff. I like it. Yeah, and I love I love a smart villain. Yeah. Like it just makes things so much more interesting. I I it's not as much fun when the villain kind of just does like cuckoo dumb crazy things, dumb dumb right? Yeah. Or or just wastes time where he's he's very he's very calculated. He knows how to like hit you where it hurts. Like he's just confident but he does it too. all. He's very confident, but he also does it with like surgical skill like very precise yeah, like he like doesn't that. just kill everybody and everything he's very strategic and, and and strategic and and even plutarch heavensby is just very very precise as well which is i think why they're getting along so well together to kind of make this happen and mm-hmm. so um the games are about to begin katniss is about to be launched into the games but for some reason when like the the door, it's like a clear glass, like sphere that she's in. She's about to be like, like on an elevator, like brought up. Um, but for some reason she gets behind the glass, it closes and then nothing happens. And she's like, they're looking around and wondering why it's not working. Oh, oh and by the way, Cinna is with her to kind of say his goodbye. Mm-hmm. So when the glass closes, she's wondering why she's waiting. And it turns out the peacekeepers come out and they beat the crap out of Cinna. <laughs> it's like nuts. really, <laughs> yeah. it's awful and she's like trying like i get a little emotional thinking about it she's like trying to get to him trying to help him but she can't and um basically it's insinuated that they um that they kill him 
Yeah, it's the nastiness that I kind of wanted from the first movie that like because it's PG-13, they want to be mm. really op- they want to they want to make their money back. Plus that movie's arguably a low budget film because I don't think um gosh, who who did this one? Lionsgate. Um they're not like a massive company. I think they're like a subsidiary, so they have to be careful about like what they use. Um mm-hmm. money-wise and when they hit it high with Hunger Games, they were like we got we can put more money into it and mm. they can risk more and so they were probably more comfortable showing more violence and stuff so i i like that like in this one like the games are made more serious by like death yeah. happens before the games even begin yeah and it like i was like ah this is nuts like like i was like plutarch and um snow are really like uh disrupting katniss immediately she can't go in focus she has to go in like recovering and then has like the disorientation um of the uh, event but the best thing is not narrative but movie wise is when this transition happens from this event to the Hunger Games, the aspect ratio changes to basically my favorite aspect ratio. I, I always forget what the particular shape of the screen is. I don't know if you noticed this. You pro- your brain probably no, did. Maybe. Um, <laughs> so there's the two black bars uh, throughout the, on top and bottom of the screen for most of the movie. My Blu-ray copy, I think it um, shows the entire Hunger Games in the IMAX framing so it's really big really big Mm. framing and they specifically as she's going up the elevator which is dark the aspect ratio can't you can watch it slowly open up and then it's like really bright and it kind of goes really well with the fact that like we've gone from a dark room to a brightly sunlit shining wet environment because there's water now it's not just a field and um it just like immediately i i first rewound it to just double check like i didn't my eyes aren't tricking me. Um, Right. Like they didn't just change the lens. They actually changed the aspect ratio. Mm. And I know I'm just geeking out about visuals, but like (laughs) there's something really effective about that, that like, if you have this movie on Blu-ray, just kind of skip to that chapter and and watch it. And it like, you really like, I participated in the film with Katniss about like the shock of like, you're now yeah. in this totally new environment that looks completely different from the previous Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the the whole sequence, it, basically the rest of the movie is in this view and it looks great. I, I always think this particular framing just makes people look just so you just can soak in so much more color and everything. And mm. then it, once the Hunger Games end, like a particular point, it cuts back to the smaller aspect ratio. But yeah, I thought this was such a good choice. This is this is pretty much when I was like, okay, I'm in it. Here but it's go. like the last time where <laughs> like the first movie, once the Hunger Games started, I was like, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's so. a very slow lead up to like the actual games. But I think it's because um, the author just found, I'm assuming, I, I haven't um, seen any interviews, but I'm just assuming the author really wanted to make this like commentary about society. Um, and like the news and propaganda and reality TV and just trauma. Like she's, she's like making all of these like connections that, and then kind of thrusts you into this world where it all kind of like collides in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I, so it is like the more exciting stuff does happen. I think once the game starts, but I, I do, I do still appreciate like the slow lead up because I like those things. Hey there, listener. Want to influence the podcast? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. Like, and as you described, like Katniss is like disoriented, trying to just keep it together. She's probably nervous to begin with, by the way, like I have to do this yeah. again. What if I fail? Like, I'm sure there's just so much going on in her mind. And then to have she's that- not catatonic, like the first one, but right. she is like, obviously yeah. freaked out. Cause it's like, yeah. come on, I got to do this again. Like this sucks. <laughs> yeah. But, but she's also like motivated, not just for her family, but I think also for PETA, like she wants to, like she's, mm-hmm. she's going to do it. And I kind of like that, like, a, like that that firm look on her face where she's like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna make it to my the, the cornucopia which is where all the supplies are yeah and so they the timer goes off everybody's making a run for it 
And when she gets to the cornucopia, she sees Finnick and Finnick is wearing the gold band or the gold bracelet that Hamish yeah. originally had, which proves that he is an ally and not just like pretending. And so they fight together with the Alpita and they take mags with them and they're all able to escape with all their things out of the cornucopia and they all run into the jungle with all their stuff. And Katniss, which I feel like I totally understand where she's coming from. She still doesn't trust Finnick. Yeah. Um, but realizes that if she wants to survive, they have to, for now, work together. You can't be pretty and also good. <laughs> it just isn't possible. <laughs> it's just not possible. Uh, but as she um, as she's walking through the jungle to find fresh water, Peta, Peta has like a near-death experience. He accidentally hits the force field that like outlines the edge of the arena he stops breathing. Finnick saves his life. And I think what's funny is that even after saving his life, Katniss still is like, I don't trust you. I'll take the first watch. I'm going to be keeping my eyes on you. And again, it's, 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 a sur- it's survival where mm. she's, she is not interested in making people feel comfortable in making friends in being completely reasonable. She's focused on surviving and protecting Peta because she cares for him. But after finding a place to rest after all of that, um, Hamish sends them a spile, which is like a tool where you can get fresh water from from trees. And I'm wondering if that's like a real thing. I actually didn't look into it, but I thought that that was pretty neat that they were able to to get fresh water that way. I'm curious also if it would run water that fast. I do know the inside of a tree is really really moist the outside's extremely hard the inside is almost like mushy it's really strange mm. but probably uh, yeah, yeah probably not but <laughs> it, it's a movie it makes so for a fun scene <laughs> yeah <laughs> it makes for a funny scene yeah. right so um they they find their their fresh water they hear later in the night like this strange clanging sound and they see lightning striking a tree you find out more about what that is later in the film, but they're just kind of like settling in, trying to figure out what their next move is. But now that they found fresh water, that's when the real fun happens. So Katniss wakes up and she sees like this fog coming towards them. Mm-hmm. And as she reaches out to touch it, her hand is severely burned. She warns the others that the fog is poison and they all start running. But it's a fog. Like, how fast can you run before it, yeah, 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 yeah. it touches you, which adds to the intensity of the scene. And they're as they're running, they continue to get grazed by the fog and severely burned. Peta can no longer run, in which Mags, which that scene makes me cry every single time, Mags <laughs> decides to sacrifice herself so that Finnick can carry Peta to safety. So she says, like, in her own way, she kisses Finnick goodbye and then just walks straight into the fog Mm -hmm. which i Mm -hmm. thought was interesting even as she dies she makes like zero sound yeah so (laughs) yeah uh i i wish i wish the movie worked with me emotionally because i like getting emotional with movies this didn't this didn't really affect me Mm. and one other scene later i wish affected me but yeah i i sort of saw it more as just like narratively i was just thinking like okay good like she's not doing a whole lot <laughs> so right. we need she she obviously exists to affect one of the other characters because she doesn't even have a voice so like she yeah so she, I, I was can, just yeah i can see that a little i was just like disappointed uh i i was hoping for something a, a little more um but yeah i uh that that's all i got on mags that's it no it's fine <laughs> i mean i i still i i felt a connection i think just because i imagined things about her in my mind which mm. is like what made it feel so emotional. But anyway, um, so they're able, they get to a certain point where the fog just no longer is moving. It kind of like hits this invisible barrier. Mm-hmm. So they rinse out their wounds and water, which heals them. Why? Who knows? It's a movie. Um, but they are then attacked as they're trying to recover. They're then attacked by mutts, these like ravenous baboons. Mm-hmm. And in the heat of they're fighting for their lives and in the heat of the battle, they actually find another contestant. Um, they're called morphlings. I think they're like, they're people who are addicted to like the drug morphling. Um, and so they, cause, and these were people that survived the game simply by hiding until yeah. everyone else was dead. So the morphling, uh, female morphling is hiding 
But then it seems that when a when a baboon is gonna like attack Peta, she like throws herself in the in its way to like protect him. But of course she's then um she's then severely um bitten and ends up dying. And um they're they're all able to make their way to the beach, which then stops the mutts, kind of like with the fog. They're not really able to go like until they can only go until a certain point. Mm. So they find safety on the beach. But it leaves PETA wondering why would this female morphling do all of this to save my life? Um, which again is answered later in the in the film. But they set up camp on the beach and while they're eating, they find Joanna and BD and Wyrus and coming out of the jungle. And while Katniss knows that BD and Wyrus are allies, she still doesn't really trust Joanna. And Joanna's character is like a very loud, um, angry, um, frustrated, openly frustrated character. But basically every movie I've seen Jenna Malone in, she's been the same character. So, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> kind of the same i guess she in, does uh, it Donnie really Darko, well kind yeah. of the same in the end demon so yeah <laughs> yeah well she but she you know she she plays her part really well and we find out from wireless because wireless is really dehydrated she's seemingly delirious but she keeps saying this phrase tiktok and as katniss starts to put all these little pieces together and why why wireless would be saying that thinking about the other like threats that they've seen Mm. she and even thinking about the lightning strike all those pieces come together in katniss's mind and she realizes that the arena is structured in the shape of a clock where there's a new threat every hour and then noon and midnight are marked by the lightning hitting the tree Mm -hmm. and so with this information they decide to try to map out where the threats are they try to figure out their next move but sadly wireless is then there's like a surprise attack and wireless is killed by one of the careers um, a fight ensues, and while Katniss tries to chase the careers, the game maker spins the cornucopia, um, causing them to flee and, ret- and retreat back to the beach. And when they reach the beach, Katniss and Finnick are caught in another threat. So it's like you see another aspect of the of the game, it's the mm-hmm. Jabber Jays, which is like birds that mimic sound. Um, they start mimicking noises of their loved ones, like Pram and Finnick's girlfriend, Annie, being tortured. So you hear them like screaming and crying out for help, but it's coming from this bird, which by the way, is very freaky, if you ask me. Yes. And it lasts an hour, but they're able to survive it. And I remember Mm -hmm. seeing that scene for the first time and being like, is that really like, it's just noise. Like, how would that really affect them? But then I thought to myself, if I was hearing the cries of my loved ones being tortured again and again, also knowing that Jabber J's copy sound and wondering if they've actually been tortured, it would drive right. me crazy. So I can for definitely hour, see how for an hour, yeah. I can just imagine how that just really, really messed them up as if they're not traumatized enough. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, just put it on the file. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Um, but anyway, BD then, um, after that threat is done and they're able to to join back with the with their team... BD comes up with a plan. He has this really special coil and he's going to use it to electrify the careers. So he feels that if he connects his coil to the lightning tree Mm -hmm. and then the other end to the beach, if the careers follow them and, or try to take claim of the beach, they'll be able to electrify them. And it's kind of like while they're waiting for the, the midnight or if it's, it's not noon, it's midnight. So while they're waiting for midnight, um, so that they can hatch this plan, Katniss and Peta realize that if they are successful, they're going to have to leave this group because once the careers are dead, are they going to all just start turning on each other next? Right. Yeah, so yeah, they yeah. don't know like what to do, but they want each other to survive the games and they start expressing how much they need each other and how much they love each other. And what I actually really like about this scene is that I think Katniss... And again, just kind of what I love about Katniss's journey is that she spent so much of her life 
trying to take care of people where she was kind of like forced to grow up really quickly. She's never really been able to understand like what it feels like to like be in, in love with someone in a, in a romantic way. I yeah. think in, in that she's still very immature and just unsure. So I think that it's this scene where she starts to realize how much she actually does love him. Even if she just loves him as a friend, maybe it's starting to become more than that. Sure. I think that she's coming to that realization for herself and not really being coerced in any way, which is again, what I like. And then Pete is just being honest. Like he's always been that he, that he loves her and that he cares for her. So I thought this was a really sweet and um, tender moment versus when she spends time with Gail it almost seems like she just feels sad for him. It feels like actors talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. Because they they don't really have a lot of scenes together anyway. Right. Um, and even in the first movie, Gail only exists to be Katniss's significant other as a dramatic like tool for the stuff with PETA. And mm. so while I can see the young adult fiction part of like, you have your character and they have two people to choose between the fiction, at least as displayed here in the movies kind of just asserts that like there, there isn't really a decision to be made. It's mm. more just, I, I have suspicion. So maybe it's me becoming team PETA but like just the fact that like this the narrative dr drama would just be that like Gail doesn't matter PETA is the main romantic influence yeah. and so what's going to be effective is whether I will be emotionally engaged when Katniss chooses PETA or I will be emotionally engaged when Pat Katniss denies PETA because she is presently with gail but yeah. it ultimately doesn't she's not shoot like as as a viewer watching the fiction she's not choosing gail it's not like in twilight where it's yeah like, do i choose jacob or or edward where i actually feel like <laughs> right. you're choosing between two real people gail isn't really a real person he's just a guy to get whipped and, and that's like it so i i uh i could see like how maybe that would be how it was engaged in some ways but for me, I, I almost just see it more as like, it just adds more drama. Is to... it, right. Is it going to be PETA or not PETA? Right. Not exactly. I don't PETA go as a PETA or Gail. Additionally, yeah. I do wish this scene was more effective for me because I do find PETA's character interesting. He's mm -hmm. not the focus of the movie because the movie has a lot to juggle. Right. Um, but like I wish, and I wish like these two characters just had more things to, to do that weren't, that that wasn't like action se excitement sequences because I would have liked like just the line of like nobody cares about me coming from Peter's mouth is a, yeah. such a heavy thing that I was like yeah. I wish I was sad like I wish I Aww. I'm sure a lot of people were <laughs> yeah I, I'm sure a lot of people really connected with it and they like mm -hmm. put themselves there but like I wanted to feel that when the character said it. And right. like, I even thought that in my head, I was like, man, I wish I felt something. Um, Aww, but I yeah. just was like, okay, like that's, I'm getting more about his character. So maybe by the time we get to the third or fourth movie, I'll be um, more emotionally engaged. But I, uh, maybe. I wasn't there yet with this one. But I, I like his character. And I like, I, I like the dynamic of his character. I, if I think yeah. if I liked his character, as a character, I would have been emotionally engaged. But mm. I like the idea of someone as I described before, where like, they are romantically interested in someone else and they're in the position where they have to perform like they're married and with child. So that's right. just like so weird it <laughs> and, is, and really yeah. interesting and disorienting. I I remember like watching my friends in high school when they were doing the theater and they would get disoriented when like they were playing characters who liked <laughs> each other. And like the curse of that is that sometimes they're like, yeah, but unless <laughs> and it's mm, just like, yeah, it's like, no, you're on stage. That's, this is totally right. fake. It's performative. Um, and if you guys try and date while you're doing the show and then you break up while you're still doing the show, you're going to kill disaster. the show. Disaster. So do not do it. Like, it's a disaster to me. Like that, that's what, what's kind of going on in my mind. And I would like, I I'm interested to see what kind of drama comes from that moving forward. Cause you could easily see a character like PETA 
And I'm talking to someone who doesn't know anything about this story. So mm. people who have seen this stuff and read them know already. But like you could see a character like Peter becoming a villain or uh, an antagonistic force because of mm. what he wants. And, and so there's like a lot of interesting things to explore. Yeah. But for this scene itself, I, I, I like the way a lot of this stuff visually looks but I'm just not, I'm not there yet. And so I, I wish yeah. I was. But, no, and, and yeah. I totally get that. And I think, I think because I have the support of the books and just already knowing what yeah, that connection that would is, help. it was yeah. right. It was just really easy for me to make those connections, but I can also see how someone might not feel as connected. I think you're making some pretty decent points and, but yeah, I, I do still feel kind of like, I think even just reading the books, I felt like Gail was, and maybe I just need to read them again because I don't really recall, but in my mind, it was always PETA. And I'm like, it's either going to be PETA or not PETA because he's just so great. And I do love him as a character. <laughs> I just think he's so sweet. And and I love how he, how he honors Katniss and her independence yeah, his and patience her is mind. Cool. Appreciate it. Like he's very, he's very patient. He's still authentically like her friend. He like makes zero his points clear. Motives. Yeah. Yes. And he's just, yeah, there's just so many qualities about him that aren't like what I would say is the stereotypical male character where it's like, I'm going to be strong and I have to save everyone and blah, blah, blah. It's mm -hmm. like, he has strengths that even though, yes, he is physically strong, we don't see his strengths in that, but we see the strength of his character and yeah. how in his kindness. And um, I just, I love that about him because I do feel like it's a contrast and a helpful contrast for um, Katniss. Mm -hmm. But we do see more things flesh out, I think, in the other films um, in different ways. But anyway. So does this mean that Gale is the stale piece of white bread and not <laughs> Peta? Because like he he's is. the one who's barely there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's and it makes sense. And I kind of like that dynamic where he does feel like on the outside. And I and I also like thinking back, I also feel like he really I don't really know how much of a chance <laughs> that he has because like Peta and Katniss have have like a trauma bond. You know, like they yeah. have this like shared lived experience that very few people will be able to understand. Well, and you're also choosing between PETA and not Thor. So like, it's just, right. uh, it's just the lesser Hemsworth, <laughs> as they say. So it's like, you, do you, Don't do you me. want Josh Hutcherson <laughs> or store brand Hemsworth? Oh, <laughs> like, just, just stop. What other nasty, unkind things can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I like you, Liam Hemsworth. You're a good actor. <laughs> oh, man. Poor Liam. Oh, but I, I, I think there's three, too. There's three there, Hemsworths. I think there I, are three. I don't know the third one, though. I, but I do think there are three. Anyway, um, so I... And again, more of these, like, changes in their relationships do take place in the other films. Uh, things, like, not just between mm -hmm. Peta and Katniss, but between Peta and Gale. Yeah, I think I but, saw, like, a photo of the one of the... Mocking Jay sequels, and it's yeah. like Hemsworth is in like full like military garb. I'm like, what yeah. the heck is yeah, that? Yeah, you'll, you'll awesome. see, you'll see. Oh, and I didn't even mention this, but there's some cool sci-fi tech in this. Like, I like mm -hmm. the ship, the ship that the spaceship yeah. is really cool. I don't know. There's there's some neat things here. I couldn't geek out over that, but it's just I liked all that stuff. Good stuff. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. And so they are about to, after they've had this tender moment, um, they're going to hatch the plan. So they make their way to the tree and BD kind of gives everybody their jobs. Um, Katniss and Joanna are going to string the coil and bring it all the way to the beach Finnick and Peta are going to stay and protect Beatty while he attaches the coil. This kind of puts a wrench in Katniss and Peta's plans to like run away once the thing has been successful, but mm -hmm. they don't want to make waves or make anyone suspicious. So they just do what they're going to, what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But on their way to reach the coil and to, to take the coil to the beach, Joanna and Katniss are followed by 
the careers. So like these are the last two careers that are remaining. And Joanna then unexpectedly, like I remember in the books, did not see this coming. Uh, Joanna hits Katniss over the head, tears out the tracker that's in her arm. They all have one. And then uses her blood to cover her neck to make it look like Joanna had killed Katniss. So she tells Katniss to stay down. She then distracts the careers and has them follow her instead. But then, um, so Katniss, kind of a little disoriented, gets herself up and makes her way to the tree. She then she sees- probably wouldn't have been so disoriented if if Joanna didn't cut her down her arm because I'm pretty sure like that makes right. it significantly harder to stop the bleeding. I'm not sure how far in the tracker was. But, yeah, but, but I did like the scene. I, I yeah. was surprised that my first thought was, oh, Joanna's taking advantage of the moment. Mm. But then I was like, no, she is doing something clever to to make it seem like Katniss was killed or dying. Yeah. So the careers would move on. They would be like, okay, yeah. she's dying. We'll, we'll hear the cannon. It'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and and I, was, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I like, like, this is probably like the third or fourth time the movie has sort of done something to surprise me. And I've liked that. I think the, the initial first one is um, the pregnancy thing the the and like so on and so forth and i just was liking all of those narrative beats because then yeah Mm -hmm. like you said katniss is also surprised and Mm kind of gets up and and then tries to go back to the tree to 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 learn some (laughs) to learn if everything's okay (laughs) right so she goes and she sees bd like take um almost like a a staff and it has like a like a pointed thing on the end and he like rams into the tree but then he's blown back and it looks like he's been severely electrocuted like he's what was he trying to do so i actually went back to the book and i also did some reading because i was a little confused as well and i think i think what he was trying to do is what katniss does later so i think he was attempting to disrupt the force fields and break the arena but I think he 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 mistimed it and failed, is what I think. Mistimed it, or yeah, because I I didn't know what was happening, but I just understood. My like my I thought it was, oh, like the walls have just closed in or changed, mm. and so it makes sense that like something could happen and whatever. But yeah, because like, the environment could close in. Well, I guess it couldn't. Um, not in not in this one, but uh. Yeah, I was confused by that, but I guess I could, at least visually, it's a reminder to the audience of what could happen, which then Mm -hmm. is what happens. Right. Yeah. So I think he was trying to disrupt, I think his plan all the, like, all along was to, like, disrupt the arena, I think. But anyway, he, he attempts to break the force field or whatever, he fails, and Katniss then, um, sees Finnick coming back. And she aims her bow at him in case in case Finnick has any like ulterior she doesn't motives, trust yeah. him any ulterior motives. But Finnick just says, "Remember who the real enemy is," which is something that Haymitch had also said to her before she left. And she lowers her bow and decides instead of killing him or anyone else, she's just going to destroy the arena. And I think she realizes what Beatty was trying to do because Beatty told her like while they were like. Early, early on in the film, he tells her, he makes this comment how there's always a flaw to the system. There's always like a chink in the armor, so to speak. And so she realizes that she can see where it is like at the top of the screen as at the top of the screen, at the top of the arena where like the thing is swirling and it's about to do a lightning strike. So she picks up the coil, puts it on her butt and the, the, the spearhead puts it on her arrow lets her arrow fly just in time for the uh in time with the lightning strike it follows the coil all the way back up and it totally disrupts the feed the arena like everything just completely shuts down and of course she gets blown like i don't know how many feet away from the tree so she's pretty injured as well explodey yeah yeah so there's a huge explosion President Snow tries to get Heavensby to like fix what's wrong, but Heavensby has completely disappeared. Yes. And Katniss is then rescued in a hovercraft, which you were explaining just looks very, very cool. And it does. So dope. Uh, yeah. And when she awakes, she finds Hamish 
Plutarch Heavensby and Finnick on the ship. And she's like, what is going on? She demands to know what's going on. And we find out that Hamish, Heavensby, Finnick, and a few others that were in the games were all in on this elaborate plan to not only, well, to, to not only start the revolution, but to get Katniss out so that she could be their symbol of hope. So she could be the Mockingjay since her actions kind of started the whole thing. But unfortunately, they were unable to save Joanna and PETA, who both, because they still have their trackers in they mention now Joanna? in the capital. They mention they that Joanna's? Don't, okay. They don't mention Joanna, but I, I think I only know that. And I probably wrote that just remembering the other film. You do find out that she was also kidnapped. Yeah, I saw she was credited in one of the other ones. So yeah. I, it's like, okay, she'll probably come back. And Katniss loses her mind. I actually yeah. do love that scene where you can just see like the passion and the fury that she has for Hamish. She's just like, how, like, how could you, you lied yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. She attacks Hamish because he promised he would save Peta, and he just, he did it because at the time they felt like she was more valuable um, because of what she stands for. So she's sedated so that she'll calm down and stop hitting Hamish. And when she wakes up, she sees Gail and he tells her first thing that her family is safe, but that district 12 has been completely destroyed how there is no more district 12 and this last scene for a lot of people including me was like very iconic you just see within her eyes this like wrestling of emotions where there's like disbelief and sadness and mourning and then it's followed by like this anger and this resilience which then will lead us into the next film and that's the end of the movie hey there listener Want to influence the podcast? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. Unlike the first one where when it ends, I was curious about what to watch like whether to watch the next one, which I knew we were mm-hmm. going to do for the podcast. But like, you know, apart from that, this one, when I ended, I was like, man, why are we doing an episode? I could watch the next one. <laughs> I was like, because I was ready <laughs> to just go into the next yeah. movie and see what was going to happen. I was really yeah. curious about it. So it was a great ending. Um, yeah, I thought I I thought it was uh, a good ending. But I guess, hey, th- this is where we're at now. We're at the mm-hmm. party pleaser, party pooper. Uh, I'll kick it off. Party pleaser. I was going to be. I was going, I was not on board at first. Uh, Mm. I felt it was kind of like it is. I started this movie on my phone, uh, just trying to like, I know I did. I start, I started it at home. So I was watching it on my Blu-ray copy. Uh, Thankfully, right when we decided to do these episodes, I found them at the thrift store. So it's really like, yeah, great. Mm. Um, Because I don't mind watching on streaming, but it's on Tubi. So I got ads. That's annoying. Um, But I started it at home, wasn't totally into it. Um, And then I was catching up on the rest of it on my phone, like when I was at work and was just kind of like, whatever. But then um, this morning I sat down and I started it and we were finally getting into the Hunger Game prep stuff because it's like, it really is like almost 40. It's almost like, yeah, was I at 39 minutes 49 minutes in and now we're getting the prep work for the yeah. Hunger Games. It's a long time. This is like yeah. you starting the fourth Harry Potter book and you are 300 pages in and you're still not at Hogwarts yet. And you're like, there's only 200 pages left. What's going on? <laughs> like right. I was, That's what I stopped reading. I was yeah. like, I'm done. I just want to yeah. be at Hogwarts. Why am I still at these Quidditch games? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I was so frustrated. Um, <laughs> but at least I got the first three done because I like that third book. Um, but I, uh, I was finally, once it starts getting rolling, I was enjoying it a lot more, but again, like it was a little annoying to kind of watch the same movie, but better. Yeah. Um, but it is better. I like this movie a lot more than the first one. I don't Mm -hmm. think obviously the editing and the, and the cinematography I started with saying are much better as I quoted myself in the first one in my, in the show notes for the first one, that the editing never was not a problem. 
This right. one, the editing is constantly just good enough. Uh, not good. It's better than good enough. Yeah, I think the color correction looks really good. So when we're at the Hunger Games and it's like this environment, it just looks nice. Uh, mm-hmm. The day for night isn't so bad. So that's when you shoot stuff with natural lighting and then you right. tone it down in color grading. Like that looks all right. There's no stark shadows. Um, and so, yeah, I but I do think it has some silliness. Like I wish... I know that like they they're now burned from the gas and then they're going to heal with the water. But there Mm -hmm. was just something like silly that I was like thinking about, like the way it looked. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then like just some other things every now and then that happened that I was like, that just doesn't look right. Not as much as the first one. The first one has way more silly visuals. But right. But this one uh, looks a lot better in in every single way. The soundtrack is a lot better in every single way. It's just a better movie. And, you know, it's epic. And when the Hunger Games start, it's exciting. It's fun. Mm -hmm. There's some plot curiosities (laughs) that are just a little, like, almost like, because it turns out, like, uh, Heaven's Be and everybody and a bunch of these players were in on it in a Mm -hmm. way. Like, there's some, like... Like, yeah, but y'all were going so hard and like trying to kill each other. Like, right. What's going on? So like, I guess maybe in the book, if there was like, maybe like other characters later in the series talk about how like they were following the plan, but they were always worried. Like they were always worried it might not work out. So they fall back into their trap of if I just trust the games, then I can, then I'll survive it. So anyways, um, all I have to say is like some of the plot will you'll have to do some forgiving, I think. But I think the movie's pretty good. And I can totally understand why a lot of people like this one in particular. Mm-hmm. I think I saw this one has the highest rating on IMDb and on Letterboxd compared to all the others. Yeah, I would sooner rewatch this one than the first one. Yeah. I think this one's way better. That. Uh despite the length, way better. Totally yeah. like it. Party pleaser for me. So yay! Yeah. Um, just to kind of respond to some of the plot stuff, I I do think that they do try to address that. So like, in in as far as like, why are they going so hard to kill Katniss? Um, you have Joanna who got Wyrus and Beatty out of the jungle, and she says, "I did this for you." Like that's the only reason why she brought them over. So you you do see that there are ways that she's trying to help out. And then even ways that she's trying to like call attention to herself. So that way maybe they won't pay so much attention to Katniss. So when she's like yelling at Snow, like, we can't put everybody in. Oh my gosh. The framing, I think, was very intentional on that because it was like, that's the framing of someone who's about to get their head freaking blown off. Like, (laughs) it literally is framed like (laughs) you're going to cut and it's going to be CG and they're just dead. And I was like, I was kind of hoping because I've been like, that would have been nuts. Like, you are really asserting like, like there, there can be a lot of control when you're Mm -hmm. out in the Capitol and everything. But once you're in the Hunger Games, all bets are off. You can turn those cameras off and just shoot some fireballs at people. So I was... I was like, that would be nuts. And then it didn't happen. But I was like, yeah. that's good. Because I think it was purposely set up in a framing way that like, yeah, you and the audience are like, oh, yo, Joanna, you should stop. Like, <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah. Like, oh, man, that was good. Yeah. And then even um, when Katniss is chasing after the careers after she's after they've killed Wyrus, I think Plutarch spun the cornucopia to stop her from chasing them yeah it's totally possible i you know so it's like you look back and you're like oh yeah yeah and also he has a gun to his head too it's very clear snow is ruthless i'm not familiar with the backstory of snow i know there's a book and an upcoming movie um which is great timing for us since we're doing these Mm. but um but uh, it's clear that he's a scary dude. So I could yes. understand Plutarch wanting to really assert, like, I, yeah. I'm i taking this seriously. And then on the side, he is not taking it seriously. So Right. He's, yeah. he'll, he'll, he'll push it as long as he can. And I think he yeah. knows it's a risk. But, like, as soon as she hit the water, he's like, all right, that's enough. He's like, oh, I hope I didn't kill her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so... Um, but for me, definitely, I think it's pretty obvious that it's a it's a party pleaser. Mm-hmm. And I I just really like how they handled the transferring what happened in the books into the into the movie. They, of course, you know, will make certain changes. But again, when it comes to like taking something from a book and making it a movie, 
I think nine times out of 10, you do have to make changes just so that it works as a film. So I thought that they did that pretty well. And I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed seeing these other characters um, like the other victors, I think that was just a really interesting take kind of seeing their strengths and their skills and how they work either together or against one another. I thought that mm -hmm. was really interesting. And I loved the ending and how much in the book. And then of course, in the, in the film, like it's just, they do a really good job of making it a surprise. Um, and yeah, just for some of the things that you said as well, I, I agree with, I think it looks a lot better. It moves a lot better. I do feel more of a connection between Peta and Katniss than I did in the first film, yes. which I thought was pretty good. I, I like that I, I felt more of their connection to one another, whereas I think in the first film, it just felt really like forced. Um, but I also love that it's like a very, um, that their relationship is, while it's new, it's very innocent. So they're not like jumping into too many things at once. But you kind of just, it's like a very slow brew, which makes sense because Katniss has never had the time or allowed herself to have those feelings. But at the same time, I love how it's not the focal point of the film. It's like yes. an aside. It's, mm -hmm. you, you do care about it. You do see it, you, you know, and, and, and you do sense that it's there, but it's like the bigger picture is still very present and at the forefront. It's like how are we going to not only survive the games, but now you have this revolution, you have this rebellion that's taking place. How are we going to come together and overthrow the capital? Like those are all the big, big things and the most interesting things I think that happen in the story. And so mm -hmm. I, I just, I've always loved how that's like the biggest, most important part um, of the, of the films and of the books. And so definitely, definitely a party pleaser for me. And I hope, um, I hope you enjoy the other films. Me too. I, yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. You got any recommendations for this episode? Uh, I think I forgot again. I also <laughs> forgot, but I quickly searched one while you were, while you then were talking. You can, so I will go, go first, first and then <laughs> you can quickly search something and okay. find something. Um, I am going to, I sometimes don't recommend like recent movies because sometimes I'm thinking about doing recent movies on the podcast, but I don't really have a particular reason to ever do this movie on the podcast. So I'll use it as a time to recommend it, but uh, I'm going to recommend John Wick Chapter 4. Uh, I caught this in theaters a couple weeks ago. I caught it towards the end of its... Well, actually, it's, it could potentially still be in theaters. Um, but I just felt like this one finally got it. Uh, the first John Wick movie is really good, but it does get a little tiresome, and then it's done. Um, and part of what makes John Wick so exciting... Uh, oh, by the way, uh, Chad Stahelski, uh, the director for these, was one of the stunt coordinators on Hunger Games Catching Fire. And also one of his, the other stunt coordinators was Sam Hargrave, who directed uh, Extraction and Extraction 2, mm. the second one, which came out, I think, today or tomorrow on Netflix. So that's just a nice thing I noticed in the credits. But anyways, um, the first John Wick is a good, slick movie we're we're all familiar with the with the how that movie is and keanu reeves is a lot of fun in that one too he's doing exactly what he does which is when he if he acts like a, a dummy like in bill and ted's he's great uh and then if he acts like a doesn't say a whole lot of things and punches people kills people that's also pretty good all the other things he does <laughs> he's all right uh but this stuff is good and john wick chapter two kind of long and then gets really samey John Wick Chapter 3, actually, there's like a solo episode of the podcast that's on that when I first started. I think it's like episode 6 or 7. Um, and I wasn't totally into that movie. It was too long and just wasn't that great. But this one, they finally got it, in my opinion. The, everything in this movie is so good, super fun. I had constant excitement, joy, and laughter. Um, they just like, they like, I just can't describe it apart from they got it like there's action sequences that are just like you you are your eyes are like 
opened wide and this is like the first 30 minutes and then like by the time you get to the end like your eyeballs are dehydrated because you cannot <laughs> like it's so <laughs> crazy and like it's such yeah. a good marriage of um practical effects and and digital like there's a scene towards the end with a bunch of cars that like if you did it practically people would be dying but they do so well with like marrying the um the the digital into it that it just feels so good to watch it's it is tons of fun um i'm extremely excited to watch this movie again i and i didn't really feel that with like any of the other ones except for kind of the first one and even then like uh like this is totally different so john Wick chapter four totally check it out like i think it's on rental at this point i don't know how much um yeah but this this movie rips it's so cool so check it mm. out you gotta watch it i think I will recommend a movie that I actually saw recently and I don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't think I would have mentioned this because I watched it after our last episode. Um, but I would actually recommend guardians of the galaxy three. Oh yeah. Um, that was the, also good. The latest one that they came out with. I yeah. thought it was. And again, I, I have for the most part, leapt off the superhero train like and just completely yeah. done with a lot of the things that they were doing but um wanted to go to the theaters wanted to have a good time i figured even if i don't love this film i'll at least have a good time spending time with my friends and um i was surprised by how much i really loved this film i thought it was so well done um, I think the they do kind of pick up where they left off with Infinity uh, Endgame. Yeah. Um, so you have um, Quill just very um, sad and broken because, you know, he lost Gamora. And even though she's around, alive from the past, she's still not his Gamora. And mm. You kind of just have them really working together and struggling like as a family, but still being together and like supporting one another. And I don't want to spoil anything else, but just a lot of really like serious stuff takes place. And I find that I really, I really loved how Rocket was just such a, a big part of like this whole story. And that's mm -hmm. all I'll say, because again, it's still out and I want people to watch it. It's just really, really good. And, um, and I was very emotionally connected to all the characters. The action was fun. Um, still like one or two things that I was kind of like a little iffy about, but as a whole, I, I really, really enjoyed this film. And I think, and I think you would too. I think if your children are slightly sensitive to violence, um, or cruelty, like specifically animal cruelty, <laughs> Because I, I do think that there are children or people who are like that, then then maybe I would read up on the film before you watch it. But I don't think it's particularly um, graphic in any way. It's I don't know mature, what you would say, Melvin. But it's not. It graphic. is mature. Yeah. It is mature, is what I would say. And I think that if you know if you know yourself or you know your your kids, if your little you six year old judge. is a thinker, then you'll be just fine. <laughs> but if they're not, they're not gonna they're not gonna be right. fine. Yeah. yeah. But um, but it, but I I thought even if you're sick of superhero films, I think you'll still enjoy this film. Yes, it was. I did. I, as I am very sick of them, so yeah, it was it was welcoming. It was still it was refreshing, and I was yeah. really happy that I that I watched it. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once-a-month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck! We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, 
The podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.